Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. I'm here today with Anthony Frazier, the CEO of ABF Creative, a Webby award-winning data-driven podcast network and production company that bridges the gap between culture and media. He also was formerly a producer for NPR. This guy is an incredible sound engineer. He's an incredible founder doing some really cool things around audio and AI the conversation I had with him is fantastic. We spent a lot of time talking about why your company needs to have a podcast, what the benefits are of having a podcast, how to get started on creating a podcast, what software you should be thinking about, what hardware you should be thinking about, what kind of content you should be thinking about, how often you should be posting, and some specific really cool hacks that he taught me about how to make sure your social media grows fast with that content you put out. I hope you enjoy this episode, and I look forward to bringing him back another time to talk about how AI can be used with podcasts. So let's give a warm welcome to Anthony. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to We Live to Build. My name is Sean Weisbrot, and I'm an entrepreneur, investor, and advisor based in Asia for over 12 years. Join us every week to fast track your personal growth so you can meet the ever increasing demands of the company or companies you are passionately building. Time waits for no one, so let's get started now. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me, Anthony. This is really cool because obviously we both run companies. We both have podcasts. We come from the same kind of idea that podcasting is great and it's very beneficial for your business or whatever it is you're doing. I thought you were the perfect person to bring on and talk about why businesses should think about creating a podcast. So welcome to the show. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, man. I know we've been looking to get this done for a while. And so like now we're here, it's almost, it's almost unbelievable that we're here. <laughs> Thanks. So why don't you tell everyone real fast what it is you do, and then we'll get into more of it. Well, you know, um, podcast right now is, uh, you know, now a, a billion dollar industry. Uh, I would say it's one of the most effective, if not the most effective way to kind of get your brand story out there, especially for advertising and increasing purchase intent. Despite all of those facts, the podcast industry still remains, as far as the people in charge of making podcasts and podcast networks, still largely run by white males. I enjoy some of that content, but at the same time, I feel like there's a big deficit in multicultural content that exists in the podcast world. Brands are missing out on this, and this is a $3 trillion audience. And not only is it a $3 trillion audience, but 41% of podcast listeners in the U.S. are non-white. There's a big opportunity to make content that is truly authentic and culturally relevant to this audience. And that's where we come in. ABF Creative was formed to create content that could fill in those gaps uh, for the most part, not just for everyday listeners, but even for brands who are looking to attract those everyday listeners. Great. Thank you for the intro. I appreciate it. So what made you want to get into creating a company that helps people create podcasts? We're just super consumers, you know, of audio content, of entertainment of all forms. And I'm a big, big, big fan of storytelling. And so for me, podcast was like, I can't go out there and build the next Wakanda on film, but I can build in an audio. (laughs) So that was the idea. Like, how can I create Wakanda in your ears if I can't create it in your eyes? And so uh, we wanted to create that. And, And a lot of the urban, Black, multicultural content that was coming out were mostly just conversations, you know, like, 
talking to you about your latest business or late, you know, and these are my favorite podcasts, right? I'm on one right now. <laughs> so these are some of my favorite. This is why I learned. But what about the stories? What about the immersion? What about the ones that entertain and just, you just don't want to think, but you just want to be entertained and you want to hear a great story that was missing. And we wanted to fill in that gap. And so that's the reason why I was like, you know what? I want to jump in. I want to do this. This is, this is something I have fun doing. I love stories. I love, you know, where the industry is growing. I'm going to jump in. And to be honest, in 2019, when I decided to jump into the podcast industry, the outlook wasn't as huge as it is now. Now the outlook is humongous as far as like now every television company is creating an audio department. Netflix just announced their head of audio and they created an audio department. HBO Max just announced a few weeks ago that they're now allowing podcast streaming on their apps. And so this is just the beginning of audio entertainment. And I'm, you know, I just got lucky planting my flag. It was mostly just out of passion, but now I'm happy that we're in the industry that's growing. For sure. I mean, my team told me that they wanted me to be like a Twitter person. Like they're like, oh, you need to be <laughs> this guy who, you know, is on Twitter and like sharing your, your things like other CEOs. And I was like, I don't want that. That's not who I am. It's like, okay, well, why don't you be a guest on people's podcasts? And I was like, why don't I just make my own podcast? It's been a year since I started and I've published 71 episodes already. Oh, wow. Amazing, man. Congratulations on that, man. That's a huge accomplishment. Some people may not realize how much of an accomplishment that is, and I'm not tooting my own horn, but the statistics I saw were that the average podcast dies after 17 episodes. That is factually correct. <laughs> <laughs> Before the pandemic, there were over a million podcasts that had ever been launched, but of which only a hundred or 150,000 of them passed that 17 episode mark. That is correct. You know, I'm not consistent with my own podcast only because I'm building them for so many other people. I think I get a pass. Either way, people always ask me like, Anthony, I want to build this podcast and how do I get loyal listeners? How do I do that? I was like, just be consistent. Of course, there's always other extra marketing things that you can throw into the mix, but the first ingredient is always the consistency. Like that's the ingredient that it doesn't matter what other things that you add to the mix. If you're not consistent, then almost none of it matters. Why should somebody not create a podcast? Who's the wrong person to make a podcast? The person who's not going to be consistent does not want to take the time to learn how to use equipment. <laughs> you know, a lot of people always come to me, I want to do a podcast, but I don't want to do any of the stuff that you are all the technical. And that's just impossible. You know, there's going to be situations where you might have to be your own producer for a while. <laughs> like, that's just what it is. You know, like you have to wear multiple hats. And so if you're that kind of person, then it's definitely not for you. If you don't have anything to talk about that's useful for another person, then podcasting isn't for you. If you can't find the, the lessons in your everyday life or your business or whatever it is that you do, then why would anyone listen to you? Nobody wants to hear about your day just because you feel like you're super important, people are listening to podcasts to get something from it. Like, what is what are the listeners getting from this? Is it just to boost up your own ego? Then it's probably not for you. So what are the benefits of creating a podcast? Assuming you want to be consistent, you have something to talk about that's valuable for people, and you don't mind being your own producer. Side note, I've been my producer <laughs> for the last year, and I've probably put a thousand hours into this podcast between scheduling, recording, editing, producing, publishing, promoting. It's not easy. Right. But now you know how to give the job to someone else. And I think that's important. How can you give someone a job that you don't know how to do yourself, especially if you are a business owner? In ABF Creative, I know how to do every job in the company. That doesn't mean I'm the person who should do it, though. Because I know how to do every job, I'm able to communicate effectively about what it is that I want from certain individuals. And many times they do a better job at it than I would. But to answer your question, why do people need a podcast? If you're a business owner, you are a media company, essentially. There's different types of media you can create. You can create a newsletter. Sean just mentioned it a minute ago. You can create a Twitter following if that's what you want to do. You can create a YouTube channel if 
that's what you want to do or or you can create a podcast or a combination of both or a combination of all three i don't think business owners have time to do all three so usually you have to kind of pick your poison for the most part and if your poison is going to be podcasts then what it does for your brand is astronomical you get to build a one-to-one relationship with your potential customers or your customers who are already there you get to nurture that relationship with your customers you get to further drive your brand messaging which is super important you know what is it that you stand for sometimes reading a paragraph on your website is just not enough for some people they want to dig in they want to know do they identify with the values of the ceo or whoever coo of that particular company a podcast also keeps you top of mind people might not be looking to purchase or work with what you have but because you're providing value they're listening every week and then when the time does come for them to feel like oh okay yeah i remember that guy or that company i'm just gonna buy it from them because i trust them they establish expertise in a certain area and that's what podcasts do the food network is the perfect example of this you see these chefs every day they got a show and you're not thinking hey i want to go out and buy bobby flay's kitchen set but yeah every time he comes on television he's driving home that he's an expert in cooking so it's no different when you go to the store and then you see a bobby flay kitchen set and you're like you know what i trust him i trust that this kitchen set is the best kitchen set because every day i'm watching this guy and he's making the best meals that's what a podcast or whatever ever form of media does for your business in the sense where like now you're top of mind you know people are like oh i trust this guy when it comes to real estate i know that this guy is on point i'm i'm gonna buy his book because he knows what he's talking about he's talked to almost every real estate millionaire you know who come out in the last 10 years whatever so it establishes that trust and that authenticity and that expertise and the last thing it does is it increases purchase intent podcast listeners are listening to you for seven minutes on average you go tell me what ad people are going to listen to for seven minutes YouTube has to put a skip button there because they know people would pull their hair out if they listen to an ad longer than even 10 seconds sometimes. Podcasts, you you have the benefit of really getting people there stuck to what it is that you're selling for a long period of time. You're not going to get that anywhere else. And so that's why you should consider making a podcast. Yeah, the reason why I created the podcast was I wanted to make it so that for these people that go on Twitter, it's very easy for people to scroll through your history and find reasons to try to cancel you or or like they misunderstand maybe what you're saying sometimes. But when you have this audio component, you have this context to what you're saying and why you're saying it in this long form. And so it lends itself not only to establishing trust, but also in showing a deeper sense of the person's personality, whether it's the guest or the host. I found that there's actually more benefits beyond what you've shared. And what you shared is actually really great. I can develop a community around all of my guests because they're all founders. And what do founders need? They need support. Right. And so I can introduce all of my founders, all of my guests to each other and that just makes this fantastic thing that's kind of it's online but it's special for them just to piggyback off what you said we had a podcast called the fat startup that we did years ago and then we built a conference we were able to get high profile guests at the conference simply because we had a podcast we were able to talk and convince gary vaynerchuk james altucher ben horowitz tristan walker ryan leslie we're talking about top of the crop people podcasts that's what did it there you go you're right you're you're 100 percent right so other things that i've thought about that podcasts can be useful for in terms of of building an audience out of your potential customers or current customers that you mentioned earlier is things like AMAs, where I've seen CEOs doing AMAs on Twitch or YouTube or whatever. So there's this potential to do this kind of more video-based communication, if you want, or a way to share uh, without really promoting your future roadmap ideas for the company, the, f- the features that you want to create, as well as potential mentorship opportunities or investment opportunities, which is one of the things that I was thinking about doing the podcast, because if an investor wants a way to know who I am without me preparing myself for a conversation with them, they can just listen to any podcast that they want, any episode. And if they listen for, to enough episodes, they'll get a sense of like, 
this is a consistent guy. This is his, these are his values. And I really like that idea. And others like promoting, oh yeah, like we know you're a customer of ours and we're partnering with one of these other companies we know you like. And it's like, you could do these promotions, you know, inside of the episodes as well. So I think there's tremendous benefit and opportunity that can be inside of the podcast or outside of the podcast, but having the podcast gives you that platform to start. It definitely does. You can be consistent. It's a cheat code for community. I see podcasts doing it all the time. Like my first million, I'm listening to them consistently now and I'm starting to see that they have like a really big growing community around their podcast, the school of greatness, same thing. I've seen that happen. I remember when he started that podcast and I was like, man, this is interesting, but he was super consistent and look what happened. Like he got a book deal off the podcast. He's become a millionaire i'm guessing off the podcast like super successful but the thing is it's just consistency because the thing is in the beginning you know people may see like oh this isn't going nowhere or they can lose steam or they feel like they're not getting a lot of listeners sometimes you need that build up there's this rapper named russ i'm not sure if you're familiar with him um and i heard an interview with him and he was like every day i was making songs on soundcloud and i was putting it up and nobody would listen nobody would listen then all of a sudden, one of his songs took off. People started listening. And then what happened was he had this huge catalog of music that he already created. Every single person that loved his song that blew up, they went back. And all of those albums that he released years before started to go platinum, started to go gold because he built up that reservoir of content already. So if you feel like you have all of this content that you're recording and you think, oh, nobody's listening, just remember it only takes one. And once you get that one, people are going to now go back and say, oh, now I could become a fan of this guy because he has so much I need to catch up on. He has so many interviews that I didn't listen to already. I need to go because now I'm a big fan of this guy. So, you know, a lot of people don't think about that, though. Like you need that reservoir of content for people to become a fan of yours. If people discover you and they only see that you only have like two or maybe one other thing, they may be like, that's going to be hard for them to become a fan, to become a loyalist. But if they discover you in on episode 100, which you're nearing, now they have 80 to 90 more things to go listen to. And now they become a fan. Now they become a loyalist because they have more to consume from you. Um, so there's benefits in that. And I think sometimes people don't think about those particular things. So you brought up really good points and I want to go into them a little bit more deeply. How can someone determine what kind of content to publish and how often to publish it? You know, it's kind of hard to get that in the beginning because like you said, you don't have that community to get feedback from. And so there are several ways, you know, number one, you can look at yourself and say, okay, what do I want to know? Is this something that I would want to know? Like, are you the consumer of the product you're creating? Sometimes I feed off of that for myself. Like, for instance, I would ask questions like, hey, look, sometimes I feel really lazy. What's the science of laziness? Like, how do we get over that? I would assume there are many other people who would want to know that, too. So, like, I, I think I'm not alone in that. Look at the questions that you ask yourself. That's just one way. The other way is to hack other people's communities. There's sites like Quora where people are asking questions all day long. <laughs> you know, that's all the site is built for is for asking questions. Look up the subject matter that you're an expert in. What questions are people asking in your subject area? You can apply that same thing to Reddit, same thing for Twitter. How does a company determine whether to do video recordings, audio recordings, or live streams? It's really about where's the area where you feel like you're going to be more consistent. If you feel like, hey, I can turn on the camera and be consistently doing this every day and that's like more of live stream, then go for it. And if you're good, you can repurpose content, meaning take that audio from the live stream, put it on YouTube as a video, put it on Apple as an audio. You know, you can take a recording and repurpose it three, four different ways to, in today. So you might want to think about doing that for your content. That way you put it everywhere. Distribution is really key. And I think I haven't said that earlier, but distribution is your best marketing. And what I mean by that is everybody's content is native to the platform that it's on. Gone are the days where you can post a link on Twitter and say, hey, go subscribe to my podcast. Most people who subscribe to our podcast discovered us on the platform that they were on. So for instance, most of the Apple listeners who listen to us never saw us tweet. <laughs> 
<laughs> most of the people who are on LinkedIn who look into look at our videos never click through to the other things. So just keep that in mind. There is a small percentage of people who would convert from your social media to actual being on the platforms that you're on. The best bet to get people to convert is through your email list or the actual customers of your business. That's usually the best way to get them to be subscribers to your podcast, etc. So just keep that in mind. So when you repurpose content, make sure that you're putting content on those platforms and you're fine with people only consuming it there. So there are stuff that I will put on LinkedIn and I just know that nobody's ever going to click that and go to the further link and consume it elsewhere. They're going to consume it right there in LinkedIn. So make sure you have complete thoughts there, but that's not a bad thing because if you can swell up a community in the places where you're repurposing your content, eventually people will start to move to the other platforms where you exist. So it's not always a bad thing. That's a problem I've actually discovered for myself because if you were to take a YouTube link and share it in another platform, chances are you can display that video in line. But when you take an audio podcast and you share the link, the preview doesn't have clickable audio. No, all of these platforms serve ads. And when you serve ads, the purpose of the platform is to keep people on the platform. So anytime you're encouraging people to leave, the algorithms for social media will start to punish your account. This is something people don't talk about. So YouTube, for instance, when you create a YouTube video and in the description, the first thing that you say is, hey, go to my website. You're now telling YouTube the algorithm that you're sending people away from YouTube, which means no more ads they can serve to that person. So YouTube is going to be like, no, we don't want people to watch this video. We're not going to put them in the related channels. We're not going to serve because you're telling people to leave. The same thing is the case for Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, whatever. So if you want to train the algorithms to love you, then you have to make the content look native to the platform that it's on. But I don't know how to do that. I use Acast, which is a, ho a podcast hosting platform and syndication network. I provide a link to that and the audio file exists there. Now, I also have the audio file in a clickable player on my website, but I don't get people going to my website. So I stopped promoting the website. I started promoting Acast. But if I use the embed player link in the social media platform, it just has a clickable HTML link to that other platform. It doesn't show the episode playable with the click. I, I don't know of any platforms that offer clickable audio in social media. Audio is the tough nut to crack when it comes to these other platforms video was very much easier to have because you can put a you can make a video a, vid a twitter video video you can make a video and naturally an instagram video but audio is just so much harder to convert and this isn't just your problem if you look at some of the larger audio kind of players in this space they, they all suck at like audio engagement on twitter and all these like, rarely do you see it you know really taking off video is the best way to go. And so usually what you can do is kind of create a video where you're talking and you're saying, Hey, I got this new podcast on today's episode. We were talking about this and you kind of give like highlights. And if you want to listen, check the link out in my bio, but you can't necessarily put a link in the description and say, Hey, go check it out. Like it has to be like, are we getting value from this video that we're watching right now? in the video where you're actually promoting the episode? It might be best to actually give five bullet points on things you've learned. And that way someone scrolling past can watch your video and say, oh, that was great. That was very inspirational. I'm going to follow him. And then they'll go on about their day. But what you're starting to do is build trust on the platform that you're on. And so that's really the goal, really. I'm going to be honest. Social media is not as easy as it used to be where you can just say, hey, I got this new thing. Click here, go there. It's no longer that. Now you have to build trust. You have to build community relationship. And the only way to do that is to make sure that you're providing value on the platform where it's at. So yeah, if you're tweeting, Maybe it might be best to just say, hey, look, record a video, put it on Twitter and just say, hey, here are five things I learned from Anthony Frazier today that can help you boost your podcast. Number one, do da 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 do da da If you want to learn even more, yo, check the link in my Twitter bio. If you do that consistently, then I think you'll start to see some results. Yeah, I'll definitely try that because I have been looking at my Twitter. I post once a week, maybe twice a week, just whenever there's a new article or a new episode. So I don't post outside of that. Is your LinkedIn bigger than your Twitter? Yeah, by about three times. I would just negate Twitter altogether 
and then just do exactly what I just said. Do that on LinkedIn and see what happens. The thing about Twitter is I started the account a year ago. I have a hundred followers as of yesterday on my one year anniversary on Twitter. So almost every three days I have a new Twitter follower. And the only reason that happens is because when I have a, an episode or an article, I tell the guests or the people I'm quoting to share it on their, their social media. So they're sharing it with people and then those people are following me. Slowly, slowly, but surely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So my, my LinkedIn gets like, 300, I have like 300 followers on LinkedIn and like a hundred on, on Twitter, but I don't do anything other than post those things. Yeah. Just repost it on LinkedIn. Like if you did that video that I just described and you did that and you repost, you posted it on LinkedIn and Twitter slowly, but surely, yeah, you're going to start build trust amongst the community. Cause what's going to happen is people don't feel like they need to go listen to get value from you. Like I don't have to leave Twitter to get value from Sean. I don't have to leave LinkedIn to get value from Sean. If you do that consistently, what happens is they start to trust you and then they actually will feel like well let me go leave and see what else he has going on now you know now i can trust when when he posts the link i can trust it's going to be valuable because he's giving me so much value without even leaving this platform people don't want to leave they want to keep scrolling they don't want to leave and i think that's what content creators don't necessarily get you know, like people don't want to leave Twitter to go listen to your podcast. They want to keep looking at tweets. They want to consume what you have and then scroll to the next thing. So if you're stopping that, then you're not building trust with them. this is the way that social media works. It's not going to work any other way for a long time. This is just the way it is. It's a scrolling culture. Either you're part of the scroll or you're not. So be part of the scroll. <laughs> For every episode, I record an intro and it's usually one to two minutes long where I talk about why I like this guest, what we talked about, why this was important to me, why I wanted to talk about it. Do you think if I were to make a video of that recording that that's good enough or do you think two, um, one and a half, two minutes is too long for people to sit there and listen? I don't think it's too long, but the, the goal is will they get value from what you're saying? That's the test. That's what you got to keep iterating on. Because it's like, if they watched your video and then never clicked on your link or never listened to your podcast, will they still leave your video with some nuggets of wisdom? Creating value is you just gave me something useful. That's exactly the reason why branded podcasts work. Because you're not blatantly promoting your product or your business. You're actually giving value. So you have to meta that down to Twitter and just say, okay, it's the same thing. Am I actually providing something useful to the person who's scrolling or am I just blatantly telling them, Hey, you got to go watch this video. I need to get value from the thing you were already given. me. And then maybe if I like it, then just maybe I might go check out the podcast. Like you go to the supermarket and you see those guys out with the sample tables. They like sampling meat. Hey, you want to try this meat out? It's the same thing. Like you're in the supermarket. Social media is a big ass supermarket and people have their tables out. You have to make sure like I have to taste it and it has to be like, oh, this is great. Let me go into the aisle and go buy a full box of this. That's what your videos are is literally the sample table. And if I don't consume something that tastes good just from this three, two minutes, why should I go and go buy a whole box of you? It's the same thing. Yeah, it's pretty good insight. Thank you. I appreciate it. Before I was like, oh, I don't know, but now I'm like, I'm definitely going to try. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why it's hard. The problem for me with videos is like, I'm not a video person. I much prefer audio. You'd be surprised the way you look right now, the way you're looking, people take this. Like if you did it just like this, don't try to be, I think when you try to make a production, that's when you'll go wrong. Don't try to make a full on production. Literally look at the camera with the headphones on, with the mic, the same way you're looking at me right now, record the video and upload it as is. If you do anything else, you make it hard for yourself. You're going to stop doing it. You don't want to create friction. You want it to be as seamless as possible. Yeah, it's brilliant. So let's, let's get a little bit into the equipment and all that. I did so much research trying to make my podcast. I already had Bluetooth headphones because my phone didn't support a three by five uh, millimeter jack. And so I just used it for here. So there's wired headphones, there's Bluetooth headphones. Which ones do you think are better and why? I do believe wired headphones might be better only because sometimes a signal can cut out. I have the Sony XM4s, the signal cuts out on them things at night sometimes and I'll just be like what the f like I just get mad they're good headphones but you know like I just hate when it happens you don't want that to happen in the middle of a production though 
<laughs> like, so to me, I think definitely you should invest in some wired headphones. Monitors, they call studio monitors. You know, make sure you're using that word when you're searching. But honestly, any headphones would do. But if you want to be super technical and super audio geeky, then look for monitor headphones. Just to be clear, the reason why someone would use headphones is you want to be able to hear the sound clearly and you want to prevent the other person or people from saying something that goes through your speakers and then gets picked up by your mic and then you can't take it out of the audio track. You want the cleanest possible audio and by by using headphones, you allow both parties to have the cleanest audio possible. I can get feedback from your mic and you will bleed. They call it bleeding. Your audio will bleed into, into minds and that's where we would you know, have an issue. So you want to prevent as much bleeding as possible. All right, let's talk about microphones. So this is something I also did a lot of research on. I've heard of people saying, oh, you need this like $500 mic and this and that. <laughs> I have a Samsung Q2U microphone. It was $60 mm -hmm. and this thing produces incredible quality sound. $60. You could buy it on Amazon. I use the USB input to my computer. Okay. I've heard of people using this analog controller and pads and like getting really fancy and like, I just don't think it's necessary. So this is USB and analog, the one I'm using right now. So I'm using a short MV7. I can turn it into an analog if I want it to, but then I'm using a USB function right now just because it's easier. And, you know, I think if I was doing a bigger production, I would use a more stable line to get the more full sound. It all depends on what your purpose is. I think for what you do, this is perfect. You know, if you're going to do like a regular interview kind of style podcast, you're using the internet, great. But when you're doing like more like heavier production, in-person, tape syncs, things like that, you kind of want a stable signal. And that's where the XLR cables will come into play. When I was working at NPR, they were using a $60 mic to record people. Like it's really not that big of a deal. It really is all about the editing and the post-production at the end of the day. Unless you're a snob like me, I'm a proud audio snob. And I do go for like really high-end mics, really high-end, you know, sound when it comes to like podcast stuff, only because like we're obsessed with just immersive storytelling and sometimes you really do need high-end equipment to make sure things go well with that stuff it's really about your preference it really comes down like we're in 2021 it doesn't cost a million dollars to produce something that's super high end. It just doesn't. So let's go a little bit deeper into the differences between our microphones from what I can see from here you have a condenser mic am I right I sure do so I have a cardioid microphone do you know the difference between the two can you explain it the difference between a condenser mic is there's a more of like a ribbon uh, microphone setup in a sense where it's like a lot more technology in it, you know, so there's a lot more happening inside the actual microphone. The sound is a lot fatter from a condenser microphone. So like the audio that comes from a condenser is it's a lot thicker, um, if that makes any sense. When I'm recording and I'm recording to like Audacity or whatever, there's a lot of bass in my voice. There's a lot of thickness in there. Whereas a cardioid or maybe like a dynamic microphone, it's more of this even sound. It's not really enhancement in certain areas unless you do that in post-production. And then it's more versatile. So your microphone can be adapted to many different environments on the fly, on the go, whereas a microphone that uses XLR cables, you kind of, like I said, you need cables, you need a preamp, you need all these different things just to get the sound the way you want it. Whereas dynamic microphones are more versatile. You can kind of plug and play and be on your way. So like I said, the lines are blurring. Technology is getting smarter. And so a lot of those microphones are pretty much coming in ways where they can be adaptable to any environment. So I, I was mentioning before, I have a cardioid microphone. Mm -hmm. And what that kind of means is like, if you've ever seen someone singing on a stage, that's the kind of microphone that I have where it's really great closer to your face and the sound can be brilliant. If you get too far away, the quality isn't very good. Now let's talk about the pop filter and the wind filter and all of that real fast. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, windscreens and pop filters, pop filters are just kind of keeping you from doing that closest. Or when you when you're speaking, you like saying your P's really uh, in a certain way, or you got a lot of you know spit coming out your mouth in certain ways. And you know, pop filters are good to kind of like filter that stuff through. And then windscreens are really just making sure like you know you don't hear like the fan and 
you know, that annoying sound coming through your mic. So what I have right now is I don't have a pop filter on my mic, but I have a winch. So this little Afro like thing on top of my microphone is uh, pretty much keeping a lot of wind coming through, you know, and making it sound really great. The pop filter would keep down the plosives and all of those different things from coming in through the mic. So let's quickly talk about editing software. You mentioned Audacity. It's what I use. It's an open source software. I've also tried Audition and a few other platforms, and I ultimately decided they were not what I needed. Audition was actually gorgeous. There was features that Audacity don't have that if you understand, if you're like a top quality sound engineer, you would go, holy crap, this is gorgeous. Well, I'm a top quality sound engineer, so I love gorgeous interfaces, DAWs. They call them digital audio workstations. And my favorite one right now is Reaper. So Reaper.fm, it's an independent one. They are constantly updating. I love Reaper, man. Reaper is like my favorite one. The reason why you want to use stuff like Reaper and Audition and all these different Pro Tools, obviously Pro Tools is the most popular one, Ableton Live and all these other, because they take plugins and plugins are, you know, digital tools to make your sound better. So you can put compressors and all these and, and you know, Audacity Audacity has those too, but they're very complex ones that, that are out there. My favorite suite of digital plugins comes from a company called Isotope. So Isotope makes Ozone. They make a whole bunch of other plugins that are really good that can help take your sound to the next level, Nectar, and so many others. If you're not really into that and you're like, hey, I want simple, I need simple, and I need just the basic of the things, Audacity is really good. I know people, I know whole studios that run on Audacity, <laughs> like where they have no other program, but they have Audacity. So you're not in the wrong, you know, you don't have to feel like, hey, I got this cheap, you know, free software, Audacity, is it good enough? Yes, it is. There are people out there working wonders with Audacity. So like it comes back down to once again, what's your preference? I think if you're someone who doesn't edit audio, is not really deeply into it, Audacity is your best bet. But you know, if you're someone who really loves audio and you really want to get in and learn the more complicated stuff, then yeah, I would say go for like Pro Tools, Reaper, Audition, those things. With Audacity, there's five plugins that I use. They're all free, obviously. They're the things that I swear by, which create consistent, fantastic audio, which are, and I do them in this order, noise reduction, compressor, limiter, bass boost, treble boost, normalize. Holy crap, my audio sounds amazing every time. Yeah, I mean, you can get good, great results. Actually, I think Audacity has one of the best noise reductions plugins, even better than some of the commercial shit. Like, so there, there have been plenty of times where I would literally take an audio, throw it into Audacity just to use the noise reduction and then go back into another program. We've got two more quick things that I want to mention real fast. One of them is recording platforms. So I use Squadcast. There's also like StreamYard and there's a bunch of other ones where you can record audio, you can record video, you can do live streams, you can share them to other platforms. Do you have a preference? Mine is Squadcast and I'll tell you why when you're done. No, I don't have a specific preference. Squadcast and Riverside FM are the ones that people are using the most. And Riverside is gaining steam, I would say, amongst the remote recording community. Um, so I don't necessarily have a preference. I do know that these programs produce better audio. Zencaster as well. That's another one I want to mention. Um, these companies produce better audio than Zoom. While Zoom, like a lot of people like to use Zoom for their recording, Zoom doesn't allow local recording the way that these platforms do. So if you're going to do remote recording, I would rather you use a Riverside or a Squadcast or a Zencaster for that recording than to use Zoom itself. But Zoom Zoom is a good backup. I'll be honest, when things like Squadcast and Riverside FM start messing up, they do quite often. Zoom is that handy dandy backup that you know it's going to work exactly how it's going to work. Don't throw Zoom away. Zoom is a solid backup. So the reasons why I pay for Squadcast is because it lets me have the video for us to share with each other. And then we have split audio tracks where the audio is recorded locally on our device and then uploaded to the internet. So I can grab your audio and my audio at the same time. And even if you have internet trouble, I still get perfect audio from your side. So they all do those same things, but Zoom does not do that. Zoom doesn't do that, but Zoom is stable. So the next thing is hosting platforms. I use Acast. There's 
like a ton of other ones. I don't even, I can't even name all of them. Uh, is there one that you prefer to use and why? There's nothing wrong with ACAS. Um, I actually have a few friends who work at ACAS. So I think ACAS is really solid. There's one that I'm really a big fan of called um, Sounder FM. And they're doing a lot with audio SEO, which is going to be humongous in the next you know year or two. So Sounder FM is a pretty solid platform. And I'm friends with the founder and CEO there too. I run a network. And so for me, sometimes I have certain tools and certain things that I need. Sounder is actually building out professional enterprise tools though. Actually, we're considering moving all of our stuff over to Sound FM. But right now we use Megaphone. Uh, and Megaphone is an enterprise platform for audio. Um, and that's how we distribute and use our hosting for the most part. Uh, Megaphone's not available to the public at large. You kind of have to buy an enterprise account for Megaphone, um, but that's the platform that we we use and we love and prefer right now. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like to share that will kind of tie this episode up? I know we've talked about a ton of different things. This has been great. I love the interview. I would just tell everyone, definitely go check out our new Audible original called Raising the Game. It's about an engineer who was responsible for the first cartridge-based video game console. And a lot of people didn't know he existed. This is a black man. He's like 6'5", 300 pounds, big afro, was in the same computer club as Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. How the hell did he go missing from history? <laughs> Like everybody that from the era knew who he was, but over time, it, people just forgot about him. Why was this guy a hidden figure? So it's a new Audible original. It's called Raising the Game. Check it out. Interesting story. It's not super long. It's three parts to it. Would we'll love everyone to go listen and support it. I'm going to go listen to it because I love video games and the cartridge was my first introduction to video games, you know, in 1992. I got a Super Nintendo. It was before I even had my first computer. That was a few years later where you have these floppy disks. So yeah, it's it's definitely very interesting. So uh, how can people follow up with you? Um, you can follow me on Instagram, Anthony Frazier, Twitter, it's Anthony Frazier, and then ABF Creative. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, the same thing, ABF Creative. Looking forward to connecting with people. I would rather you follow ABF Creative. I'm not that interesting. I post like once a month, like, you know, but ABF Creative, we have some interesting, cool things going on on the social media account. If you like this episode, definitely reach out to him and check out Raising the Game. Entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. Take care of yourself every day. And if you haven't started a podcast for your business yet, definitely consider doing it because from the last year that I've put into doing it has been an amazing networking opportunity. And I know that it'll help you with your business to launch your marketing and make it easier for your salespeople to do their jobs. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. <laughs>